Hi everyone, and welcome to our uh, the the hangout for linkages, a uh, part of our community of practice for making of tink uh, making and tinkering. I'm Karen Wilkinson, the director of the Tinkering Studio uh, here at the Exploratorium, and I just want to mention quickly, if you're not familiar with this community of practice for making and tinkering, um, I want to mention briefly that our goal is really to cover a wide variety of topics. I love these activity intensive ones like we're doing today with linkages, but we also do kind of some that are more about pedagogy and philosophical ideas behind making and tinkering, trying to connect a, rate, a wide range of people uh, in the field with ideas that are on their minds in a less formal way than our kind of once a year conference gathering that you get when you hear everything is great and there are no problems. Of course, we know that's not true. Um, <laughs> but we're really trying to get that unspoken uh, craft knowledge out there and accessible to all of us. That's the goal. So with this, if this is your first hangout, I will mention, um, uh, and you're not a member, Google Aztec COP for making and tinkering and join. Uh, we're a fairly uh, friendly bunch. We're very open source with our ideas and interested in just kind of spreading this uh, throughout the field. We, oh, I will say, even though it says for museums, we are not exclusive. <laughs> we have uh, school teachers, you'll hear from one of them today, uh, librarians, after school folks, and just people interested in the topic of making and tinkering as well. So you don't need to have a, a museum affiliation to participate. Um, but I just want to introduce a couple of our fellow COP members uh, who are participating, so you guys can can wave as I say your name, but I can't see you now that I'm only on one screen. Um, but Liana uh, Kali and Melissa Zabel are from the Exploratorium. Liana uh, has been a tinkering team member for quite some time, uh, but this is her first large-scale R&D effort that she's led, this linkages, so I'm really happy to have her share things with us today. Melissa's a new intern with us this summer, very new, actually, just recently started, uh, new to the, the Exploratorium and to Tinkering Linkages. Uh, Noga El Hassad is a visiting artist uh, in residence with us right now from Tel Aviv. She uh, also created the Moving Toys Workshop, which is how we first found out about her work. Uh, we have Gregory Louis. Um, a STEM director at a middle school and a brand new community of practice member and really appreciate you diving right in and talking about your work with students on the Hangout today. Hi. Uh, hi, is that Trevor? Oh, oh no, it was Greg, sorry. I, I'm a, at a slight disadvantage because I can only see my slides. I can't see you guys. Um, but but uh, from Lawrence Hall of Science, AJ Almaguer, Al 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 <laughs> and uh, Andrew Milney, both from the Tech Hive. Uh, they're going to share some work that they've done primarily with teens related to this topic of this programming. Uh, and then we may be joined by Keith Broflat from the Science Museum of Minnesota and Trevor Taylor from Oklahoma uh, a little bit later. Um, but I will say it was Keith who's kicked off this interest for us at a pre-conference workshop uh, at Aztec last year. And we're going to do another pre-conference workshop this year, so if you're interested, there are a few spots um, remaining for that. Uh, and then last, but definitely not least, playing an important role for us today is Jay Silver. He is going to be our uh, playful provocateur during the Hangout. Uh, but he's been a tinkerer in residence with us here at the museum. Uh, and some of you may know him as the maker of Meiki. <laughs> he and Eric on that project as part of their residency back here with us when it was and it was called Project Q. Is that what it was called, Jay? I never liked Project Q, but in fact, it had no name, so we gave it a random name. <laughs> I was going to say, what did the Q stand for? But anyway, okay, so it was random. <laughs> anyway, so with the introductions and housekeeping out of the way, let's start with linkages. Um, this is the we see uh, second hang done in a series dedicated to the topic. The last one um, I mentioned in the introduction, uh, or our introduction to it, really came through the arts. And Keith Newstead, uh, an artist in residence here who builds automata. I was introduced to linkages personally as a kid um, with simple machines in school, but somehow the ideas for me just really remained abstract and in a textbook sort of way almost until I tried making them, you know, with Keith here in the studio. 
and really essential to his artwork. I think I don't even I can't even think of a piece he's done that doesn't have a linkage of some kind. Uh, but once we started noticing, uh, once we started working on them, we really noticed them everywhere. In the toys we take apart, puppets, tools, heavy equipment. That that photo on the right is from our the first hangout we did about it. But sporting equipment, medical devices, house objects, robotics. I mean, they are everywhere. And as a topic, we thought really rich in STEM in terms of potential. So because of this, we thought it would be worthwhile to dive deeper into the theme kind of here, uh, try to develop a set of core experiences for the tinkering studio. But it's been a challenge, a challenge that I'd like to think through together with all of us today, and I'll show you what I mean. So TOPS for us um, was an activity that we had done, and also Automata, that really remind me of these these linkages in a way. They they were experiences that started by kind of offering inspirational examples and then people build things. The dilemma for me with linkages, we kind of worked through it with Tops and, and Automata somewhat, um, was that the kind of the, the things that we would offer, people would end up copying and building them directly. So I was torn between, is this really a making activity or is this a tinkering activity? And I, you know, I really felt like it was, it was landing and being more of a, a tinkering, I mean, more, less of a tinkering activity than I wanted. We're, we talk a lot about um, developing tinkerability. So where we are right now is at the beginning of this uh, arc still, feeling a little like it leans too far in the direction of making, and we want to open it up and bring it more into a tinkering approach. So Liana's going to start us off today and show us, uh, introduce us kind of to the categories of things she's thinking about with the R&D effort, and then Noga and Melissa will chime in with that. Okay. We've been working on linkages a lot lately, and whenever we're prototyping something new, we like to explore that idea in a lot of different ways. So what I'm going to share today is five big ideas of how we're thinking about linkages, both some things we've tried and some things we want to continue to try more of, and then share a little bit about how those explorations have translated into the Tinkering Studio so far. And I'm going to put that caveat of so far because I'm sure things are going to keep changing as we continue to experiment. So this first photo that I'm showing is an idea we thought of of creating a sort of vocabulary of linkages. Really simple examples that show the wide variety of basic motions that we hope will open up the possibilities of the ways people can explore linkages. Um, a lot of these were really inspired by Noga, and she'll share a little bit more about what these mechanisms are like and why we chose the ones we did. Um, once we had that sort of vocabulary down as a group, the next thing we got interested in is taking those flat <laughs> forms and moving them into a more three-dimensional direction. What I really like about this is it adds so much complexity and richness and expression to the linkages because sometimes they can literally be flat <laughs> as a subject. So the three-dimensionality, I think, takes it to a whole nother level. Uh, the next three ideas I'm going to share are things that we haven't had tons of time to try to prototype, so we want to continue to try them more. Uh, the first idea is using linkages as drawing machines. This is a drawing machine that Noga made. And what we really like about it is that it is a really nice technique to gain an understanding of how a mechanism works to see the paths it's tracing out. But from there, you can flip that idea on its head. And you can say, now that I understand how this mechanism works, I'm going to use it to my advantage to make it move the way I want it to, where you can really take your interest and um, drive it in your own direction. The other thing we're really curious about this is this idea of if we were to have a sort of pairing, it's kind of an out there idea, but a mechanical drawing machine like these linkages, and what if we were to contrast that with a digital drawing machine, something where you make a shape with program or programming or code to kind of see um, how those things might be related and how they might be really different. Uh, so the next idea are uh, was taking linkages and finding different ways to activate them. So the examples that we're showing here were made by Noga and some of her collaborators, um, Michal and Oded, it's their inventions. And 
what we like about the pulley activated mechanisms is it takes um, it takes it away from just a lever motion. You can have a crank. You can have it activated by a slow moving motor. You can incorporate pulleys. So it takes lots of different variety um, into how they're made. Um, I'm also really inspired by the work being done at the Lawrence Hall of Science right now that um, AJ and Andrew are going to share later. They've done some great things with motors and so and servos, so I want to try more of that. And then the last idea that we're thinking about is a collaborative linkage. I don't have a picture for that. I'm really sorry. So I'm going to try and describe it as best I can. But the idea is um, what if we were to create, say, a unit of a mechanism that could everybody could create, but then translate that into something that all of those individual units link together to make one giant machine. Could it be um, faces or figures that move in a crowd all together, or could it be a town with lots or a city with lots of moving parts in it? I really like the idea of taking small components and making a larger sculpture that everybody's contributing to. So those are just a few of the ideas we've tried, but what does that look like in the tinkering studio? Uh, we've tried it out a couple times. Um, at the spring fling, which we mentioned in our last hangout, where we were using clothespin activated linkages. And now, um, yesterday, we tried more um, cardboard strips to make the linkages. So we introduced the activity with the prompt of, we're using cardboard strips to make contraptions that move. And you can start with a small motion with your hands that makes a big motion somewhere else. And we encourage people to start with just two strips of cardboard linked together with a brad just to see how they move and then build and add on and experiment from there. I like that prompt in that it got people to dive in right away, but there were sometimes these moments of, so what do I do next? <laughs> and I think that's something we, we need to keep thinking about. So one thing I liked about the materials... And sometimes, sorry, Liana. <laughs> Liana, can I interrupt you for a second? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go it's ahead. like so that that kind of so what do we do next? That always isn't a bad thing, but I think you heard hesitation in their voice they're trying to do, to avoid, I think. So. Exactly. And um like I th I think making the goal of the activity more clear is something that we can continue to to develop that'll help alleviate that. So um so what I liked about how we did it of the examples is important. So like how prominent are the, is that vocabulary? Is it on the side? Is it in the middle of the table? Where is it at? Yeah, so like right now it was behind it, and um, people were going over and checking it out. Um, but it definitely wasn't like the first thing you got your hands on. So um, yeah, so y yesterday what I really liked that happened is that the materials were familiar and compelling. I think that was interesting. A lot of people were drawn to the space and wanted to try it out. And also, people got into using many different types of tools right away. So we had hole punches and box cutters and different types of staplers and lots of different types of scissors. So I think all of those things were really successful. And I think that um, some vi visitors were definitely able to iterate on their idea and have some really great initial successes where they were making machines that moved in the ways they wanted them to right away. But there were also some challenges. Uh, one challenge was some of the tools were really hard to use, like the hole punches. Um, we improvised a quick solution with some uh, craft foam and an awl inspired by what Keith does at Science Museum of Minnesota with the pencils. We kind of put together a similar system really quickly. Um, and the other challenge I found was that almost everybody really wanted to make linkages that were the intersecting X patterns um, because they move a really big motion, they're super interesting, and they're not that they're not super hard to construct. So I was really happy that everyone liked what they made, but what I found to be a challenge was that everyone was creating pretty similar mechanisms despite having a lot of different types of examples. So to kind of bring it back around, what do we want to try next time? I think I'd like to continue to work on prompts that encourage exploration and multiple outcomes. So what if we, the prompt is we're making tools that help us achieve a task? Or what if the prompt is something more definitive, like we're making moving animals? Or um, also, like Jay mentioned, what can we try with the space? How can we put out examples differently? How can we introduce people to many different examples without overwhelming ones? These are all things we'd like to continue to try. 
<clears throat> so now I'm going to hand it over to Noga, who's going to share a little bit more. Hi, everybody. Can they see me? No, just the screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my name is Noga El Hasid, and I'm an artist and a teacher, and I'm also the founder of the Moving Toys Workshop. And I would like to start by saying thank, uh, thank you so much for Karen and Tinkering Studio for letting me take part in uh, for the last two weeks in 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 their amazing one of a kind learning environment. And I've been working co-working with Liana. It was a great experience for me. And I'm going to talk on behalf of myself and videos that. Uh, uh, Liana is going to show uh, would provide some sort of a stepping points um, that, uh, that lead to a final uh, result, some sort of a final result. That's that was the vocabulary. I'll mention it a bit later. So, but anyway, um, I'll start with what I've been doing for the last two weeks. I've been doing three things. I've been playing a lot with linkages because I find it uh, very uh, intriguing. And then I spent some time um, uh, trying to explain my moves and uh, to prepare learning tools and to establish a basic linkages vocabulary for people to ease their way into this subject. And then, we've, as Liana said, we've tried things with the group and uh, on the floor. And then, uh, it, of course, it evoked. Um, Many questions, and before I'll uh, I'll pick two of them, I will just mention that my main motivation is to engage people with some sort of a, a, a meaningful learning experience. So I'm especially interested in learning by doing and in um, problem solving and quick uh, prototyping. So. Here's me, and this is how I work, and so I happen to find myself dealing with some sort of a, a, a very intriguing um, motion that's going on thanks to the linkages, and I'm very quickly find my, finding myself in a situation where I'm, oh, this is so much like a, a red-headed uh, uh, girl rowing a boat, and so I'm very, very interested in, uh, like, keep working and keep trying to find uh, ways to express my uh, weird uh, visionary. But of course, this is only me, and I was trying to see what intrigues other people in order for them to be able to, um, excuse me, to. Um, hey, Noga, um, Noga and Liana, can you guys go back to that one of the bell crane apple? Can I just mention something here? Yeah. So this this image right ending, that's how I was introduced as to a bell crank, you know, in in school. It was a it was a uh, an abstract drawing of a fixed point that turned horizontal motion into vertical motion. And what I find so interesting and fluid about the way Noga works here. This piece, you see two of those fixed L's that she's attached in this rectangle and then turns them into these squawking birds, that to two birds. And that's, it's that playfulness about thinking about the movement that you get by restricting it in one place and letting it move another that I think is just amazing. And then in this next video, you see it again. There's two bell cranks here that are fixed. Um, but then, same, same idea, two fixed, almost L shapes, but here they're Vs. You know, you get this interesting walking motion. So it's it's this fluid way. And here here's another with the with the walking horse. Um, the uh, the way she kind of looks at those, uh, you see this incredible uh, potential for kind of evocative motion coming from kind of um, I don't know, just strange inanimate pieces of cardboard. She really she has that tinkerability down that I'm hoping we can uh, have visitors experience too. As someone who hasn't Sorry, spent a lot of time tinkering with mechanical things and someone who cares a lot about how video presentations are rolled out, this set of five videos that we just watched seems like a matrix training program on linkages. It's really beautiful. I'm having lots of ideas. I want to try linkages. This is a very powerful set of videos. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. 
So, so, uh, but anyway, this was my um, my way to get into some sort of a meaningful uh, learning process, and I'm trying to find out a way to intrigue other people in in a way that they would be not only willing to try it, but eager to try it, and then later on, uh, after they find themselves holding some sort of a uh, coincidental movement uh, uh, that's going on, they would be eager to. They would be eager to uh, keep working with it and keep exp exploring with it. Um, <clears throat> so I was, uh, I was thinking about what would, what would be the best. I mean, what would be a, a nice trigger to start? Like that would help us be a starting point. Like. Obviously, I'm not using a technical a technology uh, te technology um, um, trigger here, and obviously is a very artistic and aesthetic trigger. And maybe other people will be interested in some other triggers, like more of a um, mechanical and functional trigger. Like maybe if it does something, and we produce some tools. Uh, that are made out with linkages that um, it, they aim towards uh, uh, a place where people see, oh, this is a nice tool. This can grab stuff from the fr from the ceiling, and I can get a, a nice mechanical advantage out of it. Well, I, I am very interested in trying things out. So, but anyway, uh, I don't have answers to all my questions, but I think we've had a nice, a very nice. Oh, starting point going on, and I'm uh, yeah. Again, I'm very happy and um, thrilled to be able to take part in this process. Yeah, great. Thanks, Snoga. Can you um, now? We're going to switch to Melissa, who is our summer intern, who literally just started and threw herself into uh, linkages. Thanks, Karen. Um, so as she said, I'm a museum studies graduate student and I don't have experience with tinkering or linkages until working with Liana and Noga this week. So it is my intention to show three short videos of things that I've been working on and talk about some of my takeaways for what visitors might experience out on the floor. So this first piece is a very simple motion. It's the four bars. Uh, to create a zebra. Um, and for each of my pieces, I was inspired by a structure. And then after making the structure, determined what the movement reminded me of. Um, so that's a potential source of inspiration for visitors, is recreating emotion and then seeing what structure fits. Um, I also wanted to address a potential intimidation factor. Um, because many of my colleagues here have very intricate and beautiful linkages um, and having no experience with these mechanisms, it can be a little intimidating at first. Um, but everyone was very encouraging. When Noga saw my little zebra, she even made a tree to accompany it. And that <laughs> sort of um, support was very meaningful to me. Uh, my second piece, I was inspired by the turning knob, and that skeleton reminded me of an animal swimming, and so I turned it into a penguin. Uh, with this little piece, I want to address motivation and then also materials. So as the video plays, you can see that it's not a great wheel, that it's a, a little sticky, and I could have definitely iterated on this design to make it better. Um, but that's not really where my head space was at at the time. I was motivated more to make the artistic piece of the paper pieces and the ocean scene background rather than to improve my mechanical mechanism. <laughs> um, so really, your visitors, I'm sure, will have different motivations as well, whether they're more concerned with the outside for the structure itself. And then also with the penguin, I wanted to talk about materials. Uh, I used paper, and I used markers, and I used chalk to make the clouds. So just depending on your goals for the activity, 
you might decide to create or to lay out a wide variety of materials for your visitors to use. Uh, my last one is still a work in progress. I was inspired by the slot. So I wanted to create something with that. And to me, this shape reminds me of a sailboat. So I'll probably turn it into a boat. Um, but my challenge here is that I want to add more than one movable part. That's something that I haven't conquered yet. Um, and so as I go about adding a seagull that moves or waves that move, I also want to think about how to push visitors in that direction as well, how to facilitate adding more than one movable part to a linkage. So that's, that's what we were sharing. <laughs> There's been some back channel chat that we should probably, uh, we're going to go next to Gregory. So while you're getting your Prezi uh, thing pulled up, Gregory, Keith and, and Jay and Andrew, do you guys want to talk about some of the things you've been writing in the chat box? Um, hi, this is Keith. Um, one of the things that when Leanna was talking, I just, we really struggle with, at, we struggled with at first is this idea of just doing the X, the X motion that you notice where you have two crosses, I don't know if you can see me, and they, they link at that one point. And the only way that we could sort of solve that is in our little kit that's kind of really, really limiting. We always have everybody make multiple points. Um, we don't have them choose the number. We say five is the number, not three, not two, not one. And then what we do when we're facilitating and prompting is when someone is doing that first sort of playing in space that's so cool where they move them, we say, you know, the facilitation, this sort of suggestion is to come up and sort of say, wh what would happen if you moved it to a different point? So it's, it's they're like extra points of intervention, and we, we really, um, I think it's connected to the second comment, which is how do, you, how do you recognize the expressive motion that you're seeing in front of you? Um, someone wrote about, Andrew or somebody wrote about putting throwies, you know, LED lights and doing light painting or even having graphite or something that you could kind of render the motion one more time on paper before you commit to an object? You know, what are these things? Because um, so many of the linkages, it seems to be about recognizing and remembering something versus that new first um, expression. I think it's sort of you're, you're forming your idea of what you're experiencing first, and then you um, move into what you're going to do with that motion. And that's something we noticed while prototyping. People would say, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I forgot what I did the first time. So I think having ways of tracking that, whether it's an, like an LED drawing, whether you're taking pictures of your process, whether it's sketching out those motions, I think could really be an interesting approach. I wonder about prototyping, which is clearly what cardboard and brads are. It's clearly prototyping. I always want to push it to be the, as crazy fluid low bar as possible. So I wonder if before you go to cardboard and brads, I don't know what this would be. I mean, maybe you take a few pieces of cardboard, punch 30 holes in them, like a belt has multiple holes, and then you get these little twigs where you don't bend the legs in. I mean, you can do that way, you don't bend the legs in. And just like, before you ever connect anything into place, you're like, uh, you try like seven different access points. So that's, I'm like, I want to know what linkages do because I don't know what they do. So I'm like, this is how I'm going to find out what they do. Like, I need really to try things fast because I can't spend an hour or I don't know. Like, I want to try all the different ways and throw little twigs or um, paper clips or something or brads without bending the legs and try everything fast and get an intuition for what it does. This is good. You need to work with linkages. <laughs> um, so Gregory, um, why don't you, do you have yours ready to go? I do. Thank you. I am right. really grateful for being here. I'm uh, a formal educator, so our um, education yeah, is very yeah. different um, in a school setting than it is in uh, a museum. and. We have the luxury of uh, a little bit more time. I'm going to show you kind of where this started. It came as an inspiration. The local university, Duke Pratt School of Engineering, has this 
um, bionic arm module. I'll just play about a minute of it. Okay. It's um, okay. All right, I'll think about that. All right, thank you. Bye. And Gregory, you there might be there's background noise in your space too. I think I don't know okay. that you can do anything about that if you're not wearing uh, headphones. I'm not but. sure you could hear that, but uh, basically they're they're showing a bionic arm module that students uh, kind of work on. It has this linkage and it has an actuator made out of syringes and um, uh, tubing, and that could be filled either with air for a pneumatic actuator or water for a hydraulic actuator and um, and it introduces them to the concept that engineers do cool things like build uh, bionic uh, arms and other materials and this is just a, a short video I show the kids about uh, a young kid who has a bionic prosthesis um, in which the maker community, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with this, have um, uh, created bionic hands using 3D printing parts. So my question was, okay, so how can I do that and add in the uh, microcontrollers and the servos and and this is my result. Um, here's the kids, they're sixth grade kids and what they've done is they've uh, they've created a um, microcontrolled servo motor that they've attached to their bionic arm, and they're using a, a, a push button as a touch sensor that uh, allows them to replicate um, what I hope they would replicate, which uh, I call uh, what do I call it? I call it. Um, uh, kind of a reflex arc. So does that make sense? Um, so that's that's what inspired me and then so how did I go about it? I had this idea uh, in the Duke workshop they have a buzzer that is uh, and a touch sensor that um, and a circuit that buzzes when they touch it so I wanted them to use a servo and so I needed them to learn some programming and in order for this to... And Gregory? Yeah? Gregory, sorry, can I interrupt? You're not sharing your screen anymore. We're, we're oh. not seeing the Prezi. No, I've seen you, so I know you cover this in there, so... Okay, uh, let me try again. Okay, can you see it now? Uh-huh. Okay, great. Um, so anyway, I, 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 since I, I do have the luxury of time, they spent at least an hour coding at code.org and three hours coding with Scratch before uh, they looked at Arduino code and I prayed that they would understand it because Arduino, mm -hmm. unlike the other icon-based code, is really, uh, you know, a grammatical a text-based language which looks horrible. <laughs> it's difficult to understand. So anyway, they had an early um, success with Blink, which is just a Blink, uh, the rate, um, and I noticed that they really didn't understand the code, so I decided to write the code for them. And in order to do that also, the breadboard is very difficult, so they made some wrong moves in terms of connectivity in the alignment of the pins so that the circuits could actually work and so I decided to go ahead and use this thing called fritzing and I'll just kind of go to that. Fritzing is a uh, non-profit open source that allows you to actually draw these physical di um, cartoon diagrams that show the kids is how, how exactly to wire it uh, and even with that, um, I would say not all of them were successful. Half the class was successful. They had a working model with the tech card linkages, which are these linkages that are very closely related to what I've seen you guys talk about before, these paper cardboard strips with uh, holes in them, and here's my servo motor. Uh, that actually um, operates the uh, linkage and my next inspiration if uh, I had time to do that would be to uh, explore this linkage uh, in TechCard where 
uh, you make kind of fingers, and now you have that bionic arm. They can more rapidly prototype bionic arms without a 3D printer uh, and see these linkages. Here's a rubber band that straightens out the finger, and then you put a piece of string on the lower uh, part of the finger, and if you put the, a pulley here at the right place, it uh, folds the fingers, uh, creating a grasping tool. And, of course, you know, um, if you've seen what the tinkering community have done, you'll see that there are, like this 17-year-old actually has uh, been tinkering since he was 14 years old and uh, has created a mind-controlled bionic prosthesis. <laughs> and basically, that's uh, pretty much all I have to say. I'm new to this. Uh, I've just kind of been exploring, not necessarily tink um, tinkering per se and making, but I've been exploring what would uh, STEM education look like in the future in terms of getting kids not only to tinker but also think about um, how to integrate systems uh, and, and develop a design and engineering mindset. And so anyway, this is, this is my little slice, uh, if you can see it, uh, and, and here it is working. And you can see it's made out of, um, um, of these tech card linkages, and on the back is the servo, and here's my little uh, hand device, um, which has the rubber band, which pulls it back in this direction, and the finger you can close in this direction. So anyway, that's that's all I have to say. That's great. Uh, I, thank, I you. thank you for, thank you for allowing great. me to um, present to you, <laughs> and I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's great. I would actually, I'd be interested to hear just more at some point about your insights into switching from the, the graphical based code and into Arduino. I think that's a challenge that we're all interested in. And uh, Andrew's wondering what class this was for and what grade of students. Um, I, I was given a sixth grade class uh, to do anything I wanted to do with and uh, create a maker space in the school and, and, and play around with projects that would uh, integrate science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, I thought this was a great project because there's a little structural engineering in terms of the creation mm -hmm. of the, the length of the um, arm. And then there's a little mechanical engineering in the joint and then a little electrical engineering in the circuits that they created, a little bit of computer science in the coding, and then a little, a little bit of uh, microcontroller uh, activity with the Arduinos. Um, there's one other thing I guess I'd like to show you, just because I, I'm a fan of this. This is a $40 kit, and it has... Um, <laughs> All the kind of tools that uh, we use, the Arduino, the uh, breadboard, uh, some uh, resistors, and all these sensors and servo motors, all for $40. I thought it was a great um, uh, purchase. Anyway, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank yeah, you. that's great. Well, Keith, thanks. Well, Keith was chiming in, too. Keith, do you want to just, do you want to say it? I mean, I can, I can say it for you, but I'd rather it come directly from you. Oh, okay. Oh, I was just, well, I have it. A couple of things, but I, I just was, um, we've used the Arduino a lot here, and, and we've been tinkering with the image-based um, programming languages a lot, and you can use something called SR4, which is, is Scratch directly. Um, you have to keep your, your um, Arduino connected to the computer. It's not independent, but it gives you actually a really great range, and if you've got kids who know Scratch at all, there is like virtually no barrier to just starting to program the Arduino using that software. There's lots of different ones that you could use as well. Oh, great. Thank you. Fantastic. I'll check it out. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, all right. So now we're going to hear from Andrew and AJ. And we got the special treat of seeing some work that they were doing uh, with a makeathon, literally fresh from the makeathon this weekend. <laughs> yeah. So. I think our first thanks goes to Greg for the ultimate segue into what we were going to talk about. Greg, we have been thinking for a couple of months now uh, about kits for students to do just the kind of thing that you've been working with with your sixth grade class. And uh, we settled on a kit that is uh, like the uh, stuff that Keith is talking about, 
where you can actually use scratch to control motors. So AJ will talk in a little bit more detail about that. All so right. can you all can you all see that presentation okay? Can I get a thumbs up? You can see that? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, so let me just uh, set some context. We'll try to go through this as quickly as we can. Um, first of all, uh, we work in this program called the Tech Hive, which is a design studio at the Lawrence Hall of Science. Uh, there's sort of four staff, a director, and then three of us working with uh, a bunch of teens. And there's 33 teens. And we basically make exhibits and public programs. Uh, and that's, that's sort of what we're doing. They come in every Saturday. Uh, and they work with us for about, we have about four hours of work time every Saturday. So we're doing these longer term projects and we're working with uh, older students. So they're all grades 9 to 12. Yeah. Um, I they're, think here, they're here six hours every Saturday, but that, you know, after all the admin stuff, it's like four hours of actual work time. Yeah, so we're going to talk about some of the big projects that we've done with them, but I just wanted to give you that kind of context about the ages of the kids and the amount of time that we have to work with them and sort of how many of us there are for them. Okay. All right. So here's just kind of like a um, here's a preview of the parts that we've of our kit that we've kind of put together. We've collected a you know we've kind of mushed together a bunch of different systems that we like from that are already out there. Um, but before we kind of go into the details, um, just uh, we've been thinking mostly about mechatronics this past um, almost a year, and mechatronics is the interdisciplinary um, you know. Um, uh, practice of um, you know programming, computer science, electrical engineering, and mechanical engineering, um, and uh, the design criteria we used was just high ceilings. This system has to be able to create sophisticated projects, but it also has to be easy to learn, um, and um, and the types of projects that it can make have to be have to have you know it can be wide varying. And this is you know from Mitch Resnick, Mr. Mr. Resnick's uh, Mitchell Resnick's paper. Um, and so we found some bad hearts. So for programming, we didn't like syntax and like you know Arduino syntax. Um, in electronics, we didn't like breadboarding because uh, that was really confusing, especially to beginners. And for mechanisms, we didn't like expensive things like you know um, or things that are really hard to like to fit together to make it work. So tolerances are bad. And so what we've settled on is something that uses Scratch to program uses the Hummingbird kit, because the Hummingbird kit you can actually program with Scratch, like Scratch 2, like the most recent Scratch that kids already know. And then uh, we use cardboard and a lot of pre-cut pieces. And so what right, we see here is we have you know, laser cut pieces, uh, we have laser cut linkages, laser cut hubs, laser cut wheels, um, we have make do's, those are the old versions, we're still trying to find a replacement for that. The Hummingbird is actually based off the Arduino now, but you still can program it off of Scratch. Uh, we have servo motors and LEDs and sensors and stuff. Uh, this is kind of like how um, you know our um, you parts know our parts fit together. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, and so here are some of the projects that we've made. Yeah. So uh, this semester at uh, Tech Hive, we've done two big projects. One was this Maker Fair exhibit, uh, and part of the exhibit uh, with the public was that they would make little cardboard buttons and they'd interact with these cardboard theaters using their little buttons. And so I'll show you some of the theaters that our students made. And these were made over, I think, two or three Saturdays. Uh, and so the the idea was to give them a banker's box as a kind of constraint and say, uh, you have, you know continuously rotating motors, and you have these servo motors, and you have this uh, electronics kit to hook them up. Try to make something exciting. When you press a button, something fun will happen. So I'll just flip through a couple of them, and uh, hopefully those GIFs are animating on your computer. You can see the kinds of motions and characters that they came up with. And notice, actually, can we go back one sec? Notice like uh, with this door uh, for the elephant right here, um, this is uh, something that we noticed. Um, Kids will l use linkages when they actually have to. But if there's an easier solution, like the nose of the elephant, uh, if you notice the elephant <laughs> nose just kind of like wiggles back and forth, there's no reason to use a, a linkage there. You just use a direct servo. Um, however, the door, like the door, in order for the door to open like this, you have to use a linkage. And so that's those, that's kind of like that kind of gave us a lot of um, some insight into how to create a pose a problem to kind of force the the, the use of a linkage versus um, an easier solution, which is a servo. Yeah, so I'll just keep uh, jumping through these. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more yeah. at the end. AJ is going to talk about a few more projects. You can see SpongeBob here dancing away, uh, and then AJ will talk about our robot petting zoo. Yeah, and so the the 
the mechanical theaters we made were f um, the Tech Hive student uh, interns made uh, throughout the semester. But then we got a new cohort of um, 20 participant high school participants to cr participate in this makeathon, and they had you know 18 hours to create a robot pet. Uh, this was the um, uh, this was the uh, these are some of the pets that they made. Uh, the the prompt that we gave them is that you have 18 hours to create a pet, and uh, these pets uh, some some of them will be fed by the public, and they will also be um, um, the public will be voting on their like favorite pet or like like the cutest pet, the wildest pet, the tamest pet, and the what else. Um, the hungriest pet, or something like that. <laughs> and so these are some of the projects that we've that the participants created. So I think one of the things to uh, notice is that we're going the way that we prompted them. They're going from an idea that they kind of dream up, and they're trying to use these mechanisms to realize that idea, uh, as opposed to starting with a mechanism and sort of saying, "Oh, that looks like X," and you know, I think both uh, both starting points are definitely valid, and uh, you know, it wasn't easy uh, for everyone to use the linkages in their projects. Um, but uh, so maybe I think we might actually try to start uh, with a, an easier sort of more inquisitive beginning for them to just get some of the concepts of linkages before they really try to apply them in design. The point I just want to make is that. Uh, they're really using these as part of a broader design. So it's a little bit of a different, I think, prompt than uh, some of the other activities that have been talked about here. Yeah. Uh, one thing to note, um, um, that um, our kids also fell upon the, the scissor act, like the scissor mechanism, and they, they liked it so much that they're like, OK, we're going to figure out a way to use it. And that's why the giraffe used this neck thing. Um, this, this little whale. Yeah, there it was a simple. I'm sorry. But, sorry, AJ. I mean, there it was a, there it was essential. I mean, I feel like the scissor lift for giraffe neck. It's like yes. And can I also just say one other thing about this? You'll probably mention uh, this, but in case you don't, what I loved about this petting zoo idea, it was Lawrence Hall of Science Tech Hive collaborating with the Creativity Museum and offering this makeathon. So bringing their work down off the hill and into the city and it involved this this performance aspect where you had young kids who were visiting the creativity uh, the children's creativity museum who were actually able to interact and feed these robots and hear from the teens. So I just I felt like the whole experience was really lovely. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we noticed that there's two ways to like two main ways to motivate the kids or you know types of activities out there. One is like the competition style, and then this one we just um, and then the other is showcase. And so we decided to, to use the showcase model to get the kids to build something so that they can showcase to the visitors of the Children's Creativity Museum. And uh, these, are, these kids were also all beginners. They, uh, um, they, and we taught it, we gave them some workshops of how to use, how to do things, and then they, they had, you know, the 18 hours to build a pet. So here's a little example of, like, a little case study. Here's a peacock. Their first design on the right, you see they, they kind of use two servo motors. And you can see right there how we connect our servos to our linkages. We use two um, two make do's to make sure that the the linkage doesn't like move in relation to the motor. And we made these little um, servo hubs. Uh, we just cut them out on a laser cutter. Um, and then the um, you know we had to redesign it. And so we I I actually like drew a schematic for them. Like uh, which I tried using a kinematic diagram with like li with lines. But we also just kind of drew on the right. You see like the actual linkages where they're supposed to be, but even then, like it was confusing to the kids, and it just kind of like helped me realize, like, oh, linkages are not very intuitive at all. <laughs> and um, um, but eventually, you know, they got something to work, and that's you know, it, that was, it was really cool to see um, all these linkages used in different ways. Um, and so, Andrew, will just kind of wrap it up with some things that we've learned. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we're hoping that students will use uh, these mechanisms in terms of a broader design project, uh, we've realized that uh, sometimes it doesn't actually make sense. They don't always do it, and we get what AJ was talking about, where people attach things directly to a servo motor. And I'm going to go back a slide. I put a quick return mechanism beside uh, a servo motor just to kind of make that point that um, you know you can dig through these amazing examples of old mechanisms 
Um, but if you have an easy to program servo motor, sometimes it kind of takes away the need to use those really interesting mechanisms, even though I think they're really cool. So that's something that we're really wrestling with right now is uh, how to give them the right kind of design challenge and constraints so that it actually really makes sense to use some of these mechanisms in their solutions. Um, someone mentioned, Noga was talking about uh, starting with problems uh, that might encourage someone to use linkages. And I remember in the last uh, Community of Practice Hangout, uh, Emlyn, right, from the Community Science uh, Workshops, mm -hmm. was talking about a tortilla yeah. press they made. And I think that's a really great example <laughs> of a really functional uh, project that requires linkages. So that's just, it's just made out of wood and a hinge, and you use the lever to press down really hard to make tortillas. Uh, that was a really neat example. But so we're also kind of thinking about uh, our prompts and our challenges and how to constrain those and, and sort of move people into this space of using these mechanisms uh, in a way that's not too arbitrary, that really kind of makes sense with their goals. Uh, the other thing yeah, I, I think if that's a big one, Andrew. It, oh, sorry. Uh, I just think that's a big one for me. It's hinting at what's possible. I think the the problem about the make and take to me it's like that's one thing but if if there's a way to hint at possibilities as you say there are all of these mechanisms that you can find online that take advantage of turning rotational motion into doing all sorts of things you know rather than having to rely on the step over but it was interesting AJ was describing it and he was even saying you know like to force the use of a linkage I want to know what we can do to make it seem like exactly like what you said, like I've got an idea, I want to bring it into physical reality and a linkage is just the thing it needs. Um, because it was interesting when we talked to the kids at the robot zoo, the petting zoo, um, you know I was asking all of them, essentially I was surveying the group saying kind of what was the hardest or most frustrating part and what were the things that you were most proud of and a lot of them were new to coding so I thought they were really going to be talking about coding but they actually talked about the difficulty of building it physically, but also that they were most proud of the way the physical thing operated. So, I mean, I think that's an interesting, uh, you know, duality there, that the thing that I'm most proud of was also the most difficult for me. Yeah, and I, I think that's definitely something we've come to appreciate. That's one of the things that led us to all these laser cut parts, um, is that the mechanical building uh, is hard. It often, often takes more time than the electronics and the coding. And we suspect that's partly because we're using uh, these, program, these programming languages and these electronics kits that have been really well thought through. And we're still really early on uh, trying to uh, black box away sort of some of the complexity that doesn't need to be encountered in terms of the mechanical things. So that's really uh, one of our next steps is to try to develop some of these, you know, what's the combination of little prefabricated parts like maybe we give them a little bracket that makes things easy to join at 90 degrees, uh, mixing that with parts that they make themselves. Like maybe maybe we don't have to laser cut the linkages because they're easy to make. Uh, we just have to laser cut, you know, the hub that attaches to the motor because that's hard, and the thing that lets them join things at 90 degrees because that's hard. We really want to keep the uh, accessibility of cardboard as a material, but I, and so I'm really excited about combining really cheap kind of accessible materials like cardboard with uh, things like laser cutters because I think you can kind of pick and choose which which little challenges you sort of black box away and design out and which uh, challenges you kind of keep because you think they're fun and they're, and they're good for people to encounter. So that's definitely something I want to think about more and talk to people more about in the future. That's pretty much it. I have, I have one more slide. Oh, the one thing I wanted to uh, mention is uh, there's a really interesting program. I, we don't think it's really uh, intuitive enough to give straight to students, but it's called Force Effect Motion, and uh, we thought everyone here should know about it. Uh, it's made by Autodesk, and it lets you draw little linkages and animate them. I think AJ's got an example. He'll see if you can if you can actually see that on the screen. Oh uh, no, this is not going to work. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, just let you let you just check it, check out Force Effect Motion. Like we said, uh, we've tried yeah. giving it to students, and there's a little bit of complexity to it. But definitely for the people themselves working with linkages who are interested in uh, something like simulation, uh, it's one of the best things that we've found so far. Now you can kind of see it on the iPad here. <laughs> oh, there we go. So if you can hit play, AJ. AJ just mocked this up, actually over a picture of that peacock <laughs> linkage. 
and uh, you, can, you can put in moving links and sliding links and things like that. So something to play with. Sweet. Okay. I hope we haven't gone too much over time, but that's... Uh, that's no, we haven't. Well, I want to be mindful of time. Yeah, I want to be mindful of time. This has all been really great, but I would like to, to have us do one, one last thing, and that's I'd like to hear just a bit of advice or kind of where your heads are right now, each one of you, around uh, linkages. So we can go in reverse. Andrew and AJ, you want to start? You're up. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I can't think right now. One sec. I'm sorry. So uh, the next the thing that I want to do is... Uh, build out a bigger library of examples for people to look at because I think that would definitely help with uh, activities we've been doing. And I also want to think a little bit more about other mechanisms like pulleys and gears and sprockets uh, and sort of make a better argument in my head for when the right time to use a linkage is and why. Uh, from a, you know, we, I'm coming at this from a sort of functional uh, engineering kind of place more than a really artistic place. Um, but I'd like to sort that out in my head because I think that'll help me make the activities more meaningful for the kids. So I think those are my two things. Build more mechanisms as reference and, and sort of think about, compare them, one versus another. Yeah, I think having a, a physical live watching the, the vocabulary develop over the last week has been really useful. And I think both online, kind of the, the drawings that exist out there, making those things physical, I think would be a, a really beneficial thing, whether, um, yeah, just so people could rely on that a little bit. And I love the idea, you know, you guys were saying this in the chat back behind, but, but coming up with a series of videos that we can share too, based on the things that we're doing, would be useful. And I think actually even showing them in the tinkering studio or in the spaces as, as the kids are building would be great. Yeah, somebody else, if AJ's not ready. <laughs> Liana, well, I, those guys, what do you want to say? Oh, go ahead. Well, maybe, um, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm kind of caught in this um, confusion with the mechanical versus uh, technological um, uh, activities, and I tend to, uh, as I see it, I mean, mechanical becomes like the least interesting part or least in, least intriguing part for kids to explore because it doesn't shine and it's very low tech in many ways. And I would maybe maybe suggest to separate them from one another to to set to uh, explore the aspects like the mechanical aspects with no relative. Uh, Attract no no attractive neighbors next to it, so to take off the electricity and take off the computing and let students deal with mechanics only at first, and then take it one step at a time and deal the the way people deal with things won't be like have like a global plan and then make steps to go towards it, but more like a step by step process of learning. And maybe this is a good way to to include mechanics into the the uh, salad, you know, into the mix. Uh, so I have something now. Uh, well, this is a question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, sorry. Well, I think that's why I just we decided to make the prompt a, a robotic pet, because in order to create a pet you have to have mechanic stuff. Like you have to take your, you can't just code something and have it exist on the screen. If you want like a peacock fan to move out, you have to have linkages there. If you want the little spout to move around, you have to have something there. Or if you want like a neck or just like a little tongue coming out, like right there, those are like, like those are reasons, like valid reasons and authentic reasons to create a me mechanism um, for your for your thing, and so that's that's that was that was kind of why we decided to use a pet. And the other thing I, I wanted to say was um, all the the really like the the drawing mechanisms that y'all that uh, you guys are doing in Tinkering Studio is. Um, I wish I had done that. I took a planar machinery class in college to learn about linkages, like like you know formally. And uh, I feel like even after we learned to quote unquote synthesize mechanisms, it would have just been better faster if we had just done your <laughs> your activity to give us the intuition <laughs> of these things. I like Noga's point, though, that yeah. maybe uh, at the beginning of even making a robot pet, if you started with just the physical mechanical stuff, mm -hmm. that would be a really great 
workshop to start with. Yeah. So I think that's a great point. And I think combining the physical and digital is pretty compelling for kids. So while you could do maybe more of the physical stuff up front, I think that combination of the two is a really interesting place to be. And to the drawing point, um, we are we are getting ready to host Teo Jansen's exhibit next summer, and he actually demonstrated for us a leg that he made that actually was drawing a shape that that really gave him the idea that that his strand beast could walk. I definitely, I, I don't know if you guys are definitely into uh, experimenting with that that particular concept more, drawing both physical drawings, but even kind of coding in scratch and trying to, you know, make a shape, making a physical example that draws a circle and making a scratch example that draws a circle and maybe even the light painting as Andrew said. would be cool. I think How about you, Keith? Oh. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, Keith, you go. Ahead. go. <laughs> um, well, I just got, um, the, well, there's a zillion different directions. Every. The, the last one I got in, all inspired. But the next thing we're doing is we have uh, Maker Core members just starting. And um, actually, I'm looking at these videos as a way of having this, whatever, 50 new ideas attached to it and have them sort of review it and start to tinker. From the last one, we tinkered with the, um, what did you call it? It's the bell? Um, bell yeah, the bell crank. We used that bell and crank. actually, it was, it was really, really difficult to use the bell crank. People people ended up not wanting to build with it. And it, it feels like, to me, this is really fertile, um, where we have a lot of emotional engagement, and then we try a new thing, and we and people back out, and they they don't want to do that thing. And I, I think, you know, being able to test some of this stuff, I kind of love the idea of some kind of electromechanical initiator that you hook your linkage up to. You know, you walk it over and you connect it. That might be fun. So I'm I'm pretty inspired by all these ideas, and and I I think it's just um, kind of I think the question about where is the play and where is the exploration and where is the tinkering I think that's the the hardest one. And I earlier I was thinking, well, maybe it's I I think we have to explore how expressive can we be with the linkages? How do we sort of annotate them in a way for people to see that, and then they can build? So that's the last point. Thanks. Liana, did you want to chime in? Just really quickly, uh, where my head is at a lot right now is thinking about what are the qualities of the experience that we want visitors to have. And I think as like maybe an internal team, we have like a personal sense of what the potential of linkages is, but we haven't articulated how do we want our personal in interest to translate to a visitor experience. So that's something I'm really trying to mull over and work through, and I think when we do that more, it's going to help us create a better prompt that'll get us to the type of exploration we want to see more. So that's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah, for me, watching your your trend over the last week has been pretty amazing. Going from linkages, this is like this awkward dance to get these things to do what I want them to do, to, I mean, you're Noga-esque in the way you're, you're now with that box that you made. But I, I feel like that's that's the challenge for me, that Noga is able to work with, and now you. How, how to remember what it was like Yeah, it's awkward. They aren't intuitive. Yeah, and just to yeah. say that process for me took such a long time. So when we only have visitors for just for such a short period, how do we accelerate that without losing some richness and depth of experience? Can I maybe just add to that? I mean, at some point, I feel like our we, our conversation always comes back to our learning goals um, and. I think there's a lot of different levels of granularity that you can work with. You know, you can give people prefabricated mechanisms so they don't have to do any of the actual building, and they think just about sort of kinematic chains. I think they call it. You know, the, the kind of input and output motions. Or we give them electronics, and now all of a sudden they're thinking about programming as well, and sort of inputs and outputs in terms of sensors and actuators. 
or you go more uh, fine-grained and you're giving them, having them build the actual linkages and they're thinking about the geometry of motion. So I think there's a lot of different levels that you could target and you'd, you'd change your experience depending on what your goals were. Um, so I, I'm also curious to talk to everyone about sort of their goals and what they hope people will will get out of it in a, in a more specific way of, you know, everyone wants them to be engaged and to be sort of fascinated by the motion, but uh, in a more sort of fine-grained way. Mm -hmm. Deep thought, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe we're lagging. Hey guys, I want to thank you all for allowing me to participate as a formal educator. And I just wanted to say, especially I, as a self-confessed geeky kind of guy, I really enjoyed the exploration that Noga did uh, in trying to kind of go beyond the mechanism to an artistic vision um, using the question, I think, which is very powerful what does this motion remind me of? It kind of gives me, who uh, I would say I'm not very artistic, a an entry path into that creative exploration. Uh, I, I really like those kinds of prompts which uh, take me out of um, you know, my way of looking at the world, which is, oh, you know, I see a ratio here, a ratio between the length of the lever arm and the distance it travels, and um, to uh, seeing a bird or a fox move. That's a total mystery to me. And But I think that's really, when you talk about visitor experience and kids having fun, that's what I would love for my my students, young students, to, to find is that creative and artistic vision. So, but thank you. I have to go now, but I really appreciate the time that you spent with me. And, uh, and have a wonderful uh, week. Take care. Bye bye. I'm going to sign off. Great. Thanks. <laughs> uh, do you have any last thoughts for us? I'm going to share one, uh, one thing before we go. Let's see. Um, can you guys see that on my screen? It's your screen. Uh, can you say something? Yeah. It's sort of meta. It's your screen it's showing your screen. screen. We see the Hangouts. Yeah. Oh, so you don't see, do you see the, sh oh. Ah. Oh. <laughs> For whatever reason. Maybe you see Mary or Dustin. Now you see the two of you. Yeah, you I'm just going to, nah, never mind. I was going to show you one, la one last. Uh, no, it's all right. I'll, uh, there was just an animation from Shristi. It was just to thank everyone for joining us today, but also to say it's not the end of this. I want to keep going. So we're going to continue this series. With images. Uh, so the next one we'll have is on August 20th. So to all of you on the Hangout and to folks who are watching, if you've tried some things, reach out to me and let me know uh, that you want to share some more, and we'll share those then. And then lastly, the next CO for then, which is on June 5th, and we're uh, distance learning and the fundamentals of tinkering. We're getting ready to offer a MOOC again, so we'll talk about, about that stuff specifically. Okay, well, thank you so much, all of you, for spending some time with us thinking about linkages. And, uh, I, I hope to, to spend some playing with all of them, uh, all of you, and with them in soon. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.